Okay, welcome back, everyone. Our next guest is an internationally known expert on quantitative finance who warns that the banks should not trust their mathematical models. Basically, he called this crisis. Nobody responded. Joining us now in a CNBC exclusive interview is Paul Wilmont, founder of the Certificate in Quantitative Finance. Great to see you here, Paul. Hi. So you called it before. What are you calling now? Well, I don't see how anything's changed, to be honest. We still have the same uh, problems that we had before, the herding behavior, the potential for bubbles and crashes. Nothing really has changed over the last year, to be honest. You don't think the banks have improved their balance sheets at all? Um, it looks superficially like that, but it's, that's not really the, the thing that worries me. It's the, 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 just the sheer size of the derivatives markets, the way people are always jumping onto one bag bandwagon after another, latest one being, for example, high-frequency trading. I see the potential is still enormous. Mm -hmm. Paul, we always have the potential for bubbles and crashes. I mean, it's part of free market capitalism, as you well know. I guess I'm asking you, with math models, why did they break down? Well, the mathematical models were never perfect. And one of the problems, though, was really that, that a lot of people working derivatives thought that they were much better than they, w than they actually were. And there is an incentive built into the system, the, the kind of moral hazard that, that, that encourages people to believe in these things because it allows them to trade and trade bigger and bigger and bigger. And one of the problems with a lot of risk management techniques, for example, is they, they can be used to hide risk when Paul, really they should be alerting you to risk. When you look at your mathematicals right now, what is it in the models that indicates we haven't really seen a significant difference from where we were last year? Well, it's, it's the, really the, the sheer size of things. Uh, a lot of people in, in the derivatives markets and the, the, the quants behind all of this, uh, they're, they're just tweaking their models and they're not addressing the really big issues concerned with the, well, one classic example, for example, is the, is the feedback, the potential that trading in the derivatives markets can move the underlying markets and then therefore affect the world economy. But, but, Paul, just to try to narrow this down, pinpoint stuff, is there an asset class that looks cheap to you from a pricing standpoint? An asset class? You're going to ask me about the gold price next. Well, um, he uh, likes talking about that. We'll let's look you. at gold, energy, commodities. Let's look at stocks. Let's look at bonds, for example. You know, just is there, I mean, look, the purpose of these math models was to, to sort of somehow arbitrage stuff that looked expensive versus stuff that looked cheap. At least that was one of the ideas. Right. I'm just asking you off the top of your head, what looks rich and what looks cheap now? I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to play the game of giving you any, any, any stock tips. But the um, asset classes. I'm asset only asking class. asset classes. I won't even ask you about tech stocks and the like. Just well, generally. Really, the the problem is, say, take something like high frequency trading. The 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 link between prices and value has been completely lost. Uh, the, the purpose of the stock market is actually to to encourage people with uh, too much money to invest in businesses, etc., that will that will grow and make the world a better place. But with high frequency trading. This is just about making a quick buck but, but over you, the next but few let seconds. Me just, all right, but okay. But what is there? All right, let me rephrase it. Is there an asset class that looks cheap to you right now? That looks cheap to me yeah. like now, right now? Um, I, I'm, no, I'm not going to go there. I know you, 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 you're pushing me on this, but I'm, I'm not going to go there. Well, so I'm, I'm just trying to figure out. Uh, uh, look, you don't like the models. I happen to uh, agree with you. It's uh, this uh, economics and financial is a behavioral science. It's not a natural science. It's not a physical science. I totally agree with that. I've said that for as long as my career. But your judgment, Paul Wilmot, your judgment, somebody gives you a billion dollars. What looks cheap? What would you buy? Well, let me, let me answer a slightly different question. The derivatives allow you to bet on uh, or invest in sizes of moves. So I would say that the potential for large moves is still there. So, it, so rather than is, is the market going up or a particular asset class is going up or going down, I would say that with options you can exploit either of those. All right. All right. That's my okay. particular interest. But that, I, 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 and, and I, I don't understand though how that applies to what Larry was saying. Oh, because we're, the, the, there's so much potential now for this, this positive feedback, people trading in, one, uh, in some instrument to cause that, that instrument to move and via various... Okay. Are there particular instruments that look incredibly overvalued to you? Well, 
as I say, the, um, the optionality means that, that it's large moves. You don't have to know whether the market's going up dramatically or down dramatically. With options, it allows you to say, well, either way, I'm going to profit. So options can exploit the kind of crisis that might come, come next. Okay. Paul Wilmot says uh, we haven't gotten out of the woods yet. Thanks so much for joining us I today. Guess. We appreciate it. Thank you. Larry, you tried. Okay.